still one more. Okay, cool. Right, I think that's that's enough for us to get going. So, um, welcome everybody um, to the Boxfish seminar on managing cybersecurity risk in education. Um, we're going to be focusing on the people element of cybersecurity today, um, and what we can do as um, education IT leaders, business leaders, to make sure we're continuing to reduce that risk that um, the human element can pose from a technology and, and, and cyber perspective. Um, a big shout out to EduGeek for um, helping to promote the seminar and to our partner Net Control um for for the continued support and also getting some uh, friendly faces on here so i can see the list of the attendees it's 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 great to see we've got a good sample of customers on there uh we've got some new people as well so so a massive welcome to everybody in terms of timings um this is designed to be kind of quite a short snapshot um session so it's probably gonna be about half an hour um going to keep it quite direct and punchy around um, kind of uh, mitigation and, and, and planning that we can put into our cyber awareness training programs. And I think this session today should be useful for people that are either started it, either with Boxfish or with, with something else, um, around what good looks like and how we can continue to get maximum value from a, um, the human element of cybersecurity. Or for people that are maybe considering, um, you know, we've invested in, in the in the products, so the firewalls, the filters, we've got good processing and policies in place, but we still haven't done anything around the people element. So I think it's gonna hopefully bring some benefit to both sides of those. So um, in terms of the agenda, um, we're gonna, I'll introduce myself shortly. Um, I'm going to talk through the UK cybercrime scene as, as we see it from education perspective. So looking at some of the data, some, some metrics around um, the, the change in cyber, um, particularly from an ed education perspective, um, the volume that we're seeing, kind of the growth rate. So the first part is a little bit doom and gloom. It's not there to really, to scare. It's more just to, to make sure we're all on, uh, aligned and a bit of a reality check into what we're seeing in the, in the UK uh, edu vertical. Um, we're then going to look at um, a, a proven process that we follow. This isn't a sales pitch. It is a. Um, it will be a, a talk through of um, our, our methodology and process to make sure that we're re reducing that people risk. Um, and you know, we do this for many, many organisations, hundreds of thousands of, of end users a month, um, and we have got a model that we've refined over the last four or five years that kind of works as, as, lo as long as we follow it and repeat it. So I'm going to be enlightening on what that is. And then a little bit around um, how the product stack can help um, reduce that overall risk. And I think the key focuses for me today are that we don't look at this from a necessarily just a workplace thing. So this isn't um, kind of workplace training or or training at school. This is, as far as I want us to consider today, is skills for life. So how can we keep, um, at, yes, our end users, but our end users safe at both school, at work, um, and in their personal life. So it's all around kind of creating good habits, eradicating the bad, um, and hope that we bring them to both the personal and work life. So I'm going to go into that in, in a bit of detail. And I think the other really important piece to look at is students. So, um, you know, starting students early on this journey is important. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of social media uh, bad habits that are around there. There's, um, so, you know, some nasty things that go on, in, on on the internet, particularly if you're kind of in, in your early teens. Um, so what support can we provide to to our students to make sure that they're staying safe um, in their digital life as well. So hopefully that's gonna be a good agenda. Um, I'm now gonna jump into a little bit of an intro to myself. So I'm um, Nick DeConelli, it's uh, the CEO and one of the founders of Boxfish. I've been working in um, kind of IT cyber uh, about 12 years or so now. Started off originally on kind of networks, firewalling and, and equipment. Um, so kind of the product side and then made a, a shift more to the people elements about four years ago, put in training plans from FTSE 100s down to, you know, local primary schools and everything in the middle. I think the key thing for me today, and, and this is a very positive thing, is that everyone we work with understands 
the importance of making sure their end users are, are well educated on what cybercrime looks like and and even the fact that you're on this webinar and, and, and seminar it shows that you know you're going to start looking at a proactive approach to that and um I suppose my it doesn't matter where you are in that journey but the fact that you know we, we get on with it and and i think we kind of understand the value and importance that our people play in our cybersecurity posture that's going to be a, a really good thing for us to go through so I'm going to start off by looking at some statistics. Um, and yes, they're a little bit scary, but but I think we've got to do that. So um, we'll go through these one by one. Um, it, so in the last 12 months, 83% of schools have experienced uh, at least one cybersecurity incident. Um, these are all very um, valid stats as well. Um, I can send links to anyone that wants to see them in terms of where, where they've actually come from. But what that's telling us is that the volume is there. So, yes, there's different levels of severity of an incident. So you might have at the very top of the list, you know, the worst case is a ransomware that's deployed in the network and and uh, all systems are held at, you know, a quarter million pound or, or, or even more ransom all the way down to maybe a Microsoft 365 account takeover. So, yes, there's different levels of severity. But we are seeing a lot of schools getting targeted now, and we'll come on to why why we think that's happening in a short while. Um, we obviously speak with a lot of schools that there's kind of two camps for us. One is they've just been hit and they don't want to be hit again. Um, and the other is that they've maybe seen in the news or they're going through some audits or maybe some insurance um, or want to take a proactive approach. So, so they're starting to kind of get on that cycle of, of educating their staff. But point one, there's, there's volume out there. It is happening. The next one I think is really important one around um, the, the delivery type. So um, a lot of devastation starts at the inbox. So the more severe attacks generally start at the inbox. So what we need to be mindful of is any um, training, any programs, any um, positioning around good habits. If we know a lot of them start in the inbox then we've got to focus our, our attentions around there and that's really kind of the quick win is how can we get people behaving better in the inbox then we can move on to things like you know setting and managing good passwords having good social media profiles etc but really we've got to um start off with that around the around the inbox so that's really key and then the other thing, and I know there's quite a few um, schools on here, but but we do have some higher ed on, on the seminar as well. But we do see seasonal trends in when cyber attacks occur in the education sector. So cyber criminals typically, you know, they're not nice people. They will strike when we're most vulnerable. Um, and and that often is around, you know, exam days. So, you know, are we delivering results? Have we got a start of term have we got new you know uh, students returning so we do see sometimes cyber criminals we call it sitting dormant so they're kind of sitting dormant within a network within an environment um, maybe within even within your Microsoft 365 environment and they will choose the time to strike and often that is around you know exam result days um, or, or, or return so what that means is we've got to I suppose be a little bit more alert around key events in our in our calendar um and make sure that we're keeping an eye on on everything particularly around results days and return to, to school so we know bad things are happening um i don't go through headlines and reveal kind of schools or unis or colleges that have been targeted i don't think that's the right thing to do but just a few snippets to show that you know there's, there is an increase it is making the news it is causing big disruption um if i'm being honest um since i've been working in in the people side of cyber for like in the last four years or so we did less work with um schools and, and and colleges back then and we now start it's now kind of our main area and i think there's two reasons for that i think one reason is that they are definitely becoming seen as a bit more of an easier uh an easier goal or an easier target sorry for, for a cyber criminal um so i think that's helping to drive it but then i think on the flip side um we're seeing more successful attacks which then other schools and god i don't want that to be me i need to kind of put a proactive approach around the human element so so i think that's why we're seeing a bit of an increase um in 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 i suppose activity in your sector um 
and I'm a bit so I'm going to come on to it a bit later but I am passionate that we you know for me this should be on the curriculum for, for students I think you know we're seeing more devices we're seeing more technology um, the way schools run now have more technology than than they used to you know 15 20 years ago it was overhead projectors and you might be lucky if if uh, the teacher wheeled in a TV with a video and, you, you know, that was kind of as far as tech went. And then there was a few computers arrived in the classrooms. But now, you know, some schools are fully technology enabled. There's some schools in that we work with where nearly all of the training is delivered on tablets. So there's definitely a shift from, from uh, you know, pen and paper to fully te um, technology and device based. So it's important, in my view, that that early on in that development that we're making sure that that our students are considered in this as well um, and, and they're taught good practices early on. So um, obviously this is one way audio, but but I'm going to start off with a, just a little question, really. So and, and I, I don't expect you know, so let's put it in the chat, but uh, of what percentage of cyber breaches due to human error? And I'll just like have a little kind of ponder on that before I reveal. So um, IBM did a study into, and this is the key bit, into successful cyber breaches and cyber attacks. And 95% um, of those were a result of human error. And I, I think there's something really important there. So the first thing is that we're talking successful. So, you know, while I'm on this call today, dare I say it, we're, somebody's probably trying to hack us and, you know, our Microsoft, Barracuda, Fortinet, Mimecast, whatever it is that you use, and while we're on this seminar today, we will be targeted. That's the reality of the world that we're in. But the technology removes, you know, nearly all of the, the, the nasties in our network and blocks them at the top level. So then what we're left with is the ones that slip the technology net. So what is getting into my environment that, that the firewalls aren't stopping? Because they're not going to stop. The only way they could stop everything is by stopping everything. And then we can't communicate with our partners, with our suppliers, with our parents, with our students. So they do have to allow stuff through and they're not always going to get it right. That's the reality of, of what we're in. So what we then have to look at is what we can do to reduce the human element. So we know that if something slips the net, really the last line, whether it's successful or not, is well, a bit of chance, to be honest, and a bit of luck, hopefully, in our favour, but it is the human element. So does that individual click and download something they shouldn't do? Does that individual go to a, a site and put in a Microsoft 365 username and password and reveal it to the dark web? What are the habits and behaviours of our end users for things that get through the technology perimeter? And that's kind of what we're going to send to the rest of the conversation on. Uh, and for me, I like to do two things. So I'm, you know, looking at the list uh, of participants, there's there's about 40 people on here and I recognise probably 15 names and I know that um, I think all 15 probably work in IT. So we're probably an IT-led uh, audience today. So we're going to spot most of these things, right? But, but we're not, you know, we can't expect our end users to be able to spot the way that somebody that works in IT would. So... Um, I wanted to show a couple of attacks that are, are real ones. This one is a couple of years old, but, but but the principles are the same. And just go through and reset perception that phishing emails aren't always badly formatted. They're not always littered with spelling errors. They're not always from ob very obvious, ridiculous domains. And here's an example from, from, um, from the Royal Mail. And I'm just going to draw on a few things there, that if we were an end user that received that, uh, you know, eight in the morning on a, on a Thursday or Friday when we've kind of finished our, you know, we're, we're a bit tired from the week. We've just woken up, perhaps not on our caffeine. So it's well branded. So we can probably all look at that and think, yeah, that, that Royal Mail logo looks okay. The red looks pretty spot on. Um, it's from HMRC. So I'm thinking, oh, well, that's probably not a good thing. It's very rare that they send you a big fat check saying we owe you loads of money. It's more likely that there's something there that that, that is going to cause a bit of anxiety. So you are going to want to see that letter quicker than, you know, if it was just some something random. So they lent on the emotion side with a brand name or, or an organization name that is is tied to a lot of emotion we know it's a large letter that's fine um it was a failed delivery so in this scenario what's likely to happen is it will take you to a 
a reschedule now page. And as part of that, it will say something very nominal like, uh, and it will be branded the Royal Mail ordinarily, uh, probably hosted on a different domain, but but sometimes quite a closely matched domain. But it will say something like, you owe £1.40 to get your HMRC large letter delivered again tomorrow. And you'll, you know, as an end user that's uneducated uh, with what these scams look like, are probably going to pile in your credit card details because you're nervous about what that letter is um, and you're not thinking anything more of it than that. And then what you've essentially done is you've revealed your credit card details on, on the dark web. Um, and yes, uh, you, you might have noticed and you might be able to cancel it or, or you might not hit submit, but there will be people that will go because of all the other emotions surrounded by it and put their, their credit card details onto the dark web. So if we can teach some things around whether it's spotting a Royal Mail scam, a Microsoft 365 password reset, a Amazon delivery, a lot of these have the same things that we're looking at, the same giveaways. And that is what the training will cover. Now, another one, which I think um, some of you may have seen this on the internet, I've kind of seen this a few times, but but this is almost to demonstrate how crafty cyber criminals can be. So this was actually posted to people. Now, I know this is less likely to, to appear in, in, in the school, but actually, you know, with BYOD and, and things, you know, it's important that we are covering people's personal life as well. So, so this file was posted through people's letterboxes and it's... Um, saying you've got an Amazon voucher, it's going to take the end user to scan a barcode, take you to a login page um, to redeem your voucher that will look like Amazon, and it's going to prompt you to log in as Amazon. So again, users, there's a few things that they're doing there. They're scanning a barcode that's uh, taking you to a malicious site. They're revealing their Amazon username and password. They think they're downloading a voucher. They could be downloading something nasty, but but what's going on there that shouldn't be happening is, A, they're putting credentials into a, a page that isn't legitimate. But there's a high chance that users will have the same password for their Amazon as they will for their work email or their AD accounts or the Sims account or your finance accounts. doesn't matter. That It's very common for kind of uneducated users to, to recycle passwords. So then somebody that, that's collected that information, not only are they inside the Amazon account, they've got username and passwords, they can then do a sideways movement and they will rotate that password into different web applications. Maybe they'll try Microsoft, LinkedIn, Google, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it may be, and start getting into other accounts. So um, I wanted to kind of demonstrate, I suppose, how you think Oh, a, a, a flyer coming through the letterbox. Yeah, it's not good. Most people would spot it. Most people probably would, but but they that can potentially lead to nasties on the school network by that sideways movement. So I think again, educating end users on not only just the school and eduborn attacks, but actually things like this it, it is really good practice. So there's a couple of examples just to set the tone of, you know, what some of these look like. Um, and kind of that's the end of the doom and gloom bit, really. So so we can probably all agree that we know we're using more technology. We know data is getting more valuable as time goes on. Um, we know that we've got more connected devices. Um, I believe the stats now are that you're more likely to be a victim of cybercrime than um, you ha have your house broken into. So you're more likely to have, um, which I kind of probably prefer, to be fair, I don't want somebody piling into my front door. But but we know that from a from a, from a a technology perspective, that, you know, if you're going to invest in CCTV and, and locked gates for your house, for your school, um, like training on how to spot these attacks is on an equal ROI. So, so the good news is, there are some things you can do and the things that you can do generally bring value uh, pretty quick to both you as an organization and your end users. Um, we've got a four step method. Um, Boxfish is quite a simple, you know, when we set the company up, we wanted to make it simple and easy and that's simple and easy for everyone, whether it's an end user taking, taking content and absorbing good habits, whether it's an admin running the, the system, whether it's us from a support perspective, we wanted to keep it, nice and easy so we operate this four-step method that if you follow will reduce risk and we've got data from hundreds of thousands of people that over time if this method is followed you reduce your human element risk and it's four steps the first one is identify 
And I think for me, what, what that means from a school perspective, I know we've got some mats on here, we've got some colleges and, and, and we've kind of got um, independence as well. So, um, but really it's around where is my risk? So if you're a mat, which school is it? Which department is it within those schools? Which individuals is it within those? So kind of peeling back the layers of the onion. So almost starting at a group level, what our risk is, and then ending up actually, where is that coming from? Because the, the risk is the sum of all parts, really, um, and helping to identify where, where that sits. So we do that via um, running simulated cyber attacks, which I'll come on to in a minute. There's a whole section on that. And the next bit is around the education. And for me, the education isn't just short snappy learning content yes that's the, the majority of it but it's it's awareness so the great thing about schools is you've got staff rooms you've got corridors that people people kind of um you know go down you've got staff training days so in, in the corporate world you know you don't really have as many staff rooms you often have everyone dispersed and you often don't do days where you get people back for training so the beauty of the school is you can use things like poster packs media packs um kind of little drop-in sessions that work really well in a school environment um, to help promote the general awareness. So it's all around just reinforcing what good habits look like. So it could be as simple as in the staff room, you have, you know, remember to think before you click on a cool little poster. Um, and then that subconsciously with a five minute video every couple of months on what phishing email looks like, what good password management is. It's just all these subtle nudges throughout the day that help reinforce, you know, if in doubt, report it, stuff like that. So so that's what education is to me. It's little and often, it's snappy um, and it's multifaceted. It's not just right, do a five minute training video so we can tick a box to say we've got cyber essentials or our cyber insurance is valid. It, it, it's wider than that, but it doesn't have to be um, time consuming. The next bit is the report. So the beauty of everything we're doing at Steps 1 2 is we're collecting data and we're collecting useful data. So, you know, as I said earlier, where's the risk? But but actually you can go the next step. So the first thing I look at when I'm running these programs is where's the risk? And then I say, where's the engagement in the training? And, you know, it wouldn't be uncommon for the riskiest users to have not done any training. So by putting those two bits together, what we can then do is we can say, actually, you know, look, you are on our risk um, kind of register, if you will, from a cyber perspective. I can see you've not even started your training and you can start changing the, the narrative a little bit from with your end users, particularly on the risk list to say, look, come on, this is now like compulsory for you. Um, we work with a trusted colleges that, or, or group of colleges, sorry, that use our product to help get sign off from um, MFA. So there's but push back from end users around MFA. They've seen it as another thing um, to, to do to get access to documents. Obviously, we all know MFA, it's not, it's not kind of the silver bullet, but it's certainly a really good thing to have. Um, is, you know, if, for example, there's probably some users on here that still aren't using MFA and they're getting pushed back from the board, run a simulation, get clicks, get engagement, there's your business case. So it's using that data, not only just to pinpoint where the risk is, but how can we use that to maybe help sign off other projects, um, help, you know, look at uh, even things like admin rights, you know, look at the risk list. Is there anyone there in IT, dare I say it, that is clicking things and filling forms out that they shouldn't be? It, you know, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be the first customer that we've got where, you know, somebody that shouldn't be engaging with these things is, so you can just use it as turning the lights on really to what's going on. And then the final bit is repeat it. And I think, you know, historically, a lot of the schools we work with or edu outfits we work with um, do some of this, but maybe it's once a year, the IT team stand up for half an hour and, and talk through, you know, GDPR and what what IT good habits are. But but for me, I think the key, it does get forgotten. It can, you know, it can be a bit long, that approach. So short snippets repeated as part of the organisation kind of DNA. So so that, that's our four-step method, and that's what we have built the, the product and platform around. Um, and I'm going to take us through an example now of a journey. So if, we, it, if we're bearing in mind the whole time, we've got to look at workplace and personal life. So we can't just pretend in this example we're a Microsoft 365 outfit. We can't just censor it all around on Microsoft security alerts or account takeover attempts from Microsoft. Yes, they're obviously key, but we've got to mix up some, some social media stuff in there, some parcel scam, you know, logistics scams, some food delivery things, for example. 
So what we would look to do is we would, well, pre-agree, but we've got some off-the-shelf funds, uh, pre-agree a learning journey. And there's two elements to that. There's the phishing. So what are we going to simulate? And then there's the training. What are we going to train our users on? And we basically assign that into your tenancy and it will distribute these um, to your users on the frequency you want. So whether that's one a term, one a month, uh, one a quarter. I don't think there's necessarily a right answer. I think as long as they're kind of pretty regular, then, then that's good. Some of our customers that don't do any of this start off with maybe one a term and build up. Some go straight out the gun. But I think the key is to start using um, templates that we've got that are based on real attacks so we can start educating end users to try to get there before, before a cyber criminal does. And then with the learning journey, we overlay the education side of things. So we've talked about the phishing. We've talked about the simulation, the identification. Now it's around training end users. And if I'm being perfectly honest, my, I think it's a good idea to train staff um, kind of before you go too gun ho with the phishing. I think you can run one or two baselines to get that, that level. But then I think it's really key that you give everyone the opportunity to to learn before you continue the testing. Um, we have seen some, a couple of um, uh, examples where it gone a bit top heavy with the simulations to begin with. And, and it, you know, um, if the training is not offered, I don't think it's that fair kind of balance. So, so making sure we're teaching uh, our people how to spot fish, how to avoid social engineering. So oversharing things online, um, spotting ransomware and what to report it if, if, if you're struggling and, um, you know, report it to IT if you think you've done something you shouldn't have done all that kind of good behaviour. But the key is making sure that we're giving everyone a fair chance to learn um, and we look at both personal and, and school life. Okay, so let me just have a quick, quick drink. We're going to jump into... Um, the product ever so, ever so slightly. So um, we're going to look at the areas. So I'm just going to show some example simulations that we would we would deliver. So um, we've got a just eat one here. So so what we'd look to do throughout the period is um, things like who's engaging with the email, but then actually some of the emails will have a second step, and a second step is typically something like a download. So whether it's download a voucher download a file um, or it could be a login to a, a Microsoft account and reveal username and password. Now we don't store any of anything that people input, but we can tell who is engaged with the form. So in this scenario, we're seeing who's trying to download a, a Just Eat voucher in their school network. Um, and then who's going to input some credentials of some kind and hit this scenario, it's just a work email address and hit download, but we're able to track engagement along that journey. Now, some of our schools will use an OOPS page. So, oh, that's 404. So me as an end user, I've done that and I get displayed with that. I think, you know, oops, site's down, never mind. So what you get with that is you don't get, I suppose, that, that panic. There isn't also the instant training that we can show, but there's also not the panic. So they're quite good to start off with and then we can build up from there. But but there's a, one option. The other option is more of like a training page that... Um, that shows some kind of generic tips, but 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 good ones. Um, and then this is probably my favourite one here. So this is um, these landing pages actually take the end user back through the email that they've engaged with. Now in this scenario, um, it's pretending it's come from an Amazon. So what would happen is that you would be sent a security alert or a sign-in detection, sorry, from Amazon. And if you click it, that email is going to pop up on your screen, and it's going to show you the five or six things that would would give it away is phishing but the key is for me why it's, these are so powerful is that it's based well it's in the moment so you've got the user captured there and then and it's basing it on the email they just engaged with so some really good training i think there um certainly one to consider if you're looking at kind of um rolling something like this out we then have LinkedIn examples as different severities or, or, or sorry difficulties so some very spoofed from a domain, from a branding, some have spelling errors and unspoofed domains. It's kind of the call of the, the, the customer and what they want to do. But I think it's not a bad thing to do some progressive ones, um, but, but the options there. And I think this is probably the most important one for me. And we've got the same whether you're a G Suite house or, or Microsoft, doesn't really matter. But, but the concept of we're probably all familiar with account takeover. So 
somebody getting inside our Microsoft or Google accounts that we don't want. And often that starts with something as simple as an end user giving away a username and a password. So what we would look to do, and I think these are really, really important to have at least one or two a year, is send a an email to your end users to say, usually with a bit of urgency, so security alert or a password reset, you know, your account's going to expire if you don't update it, something like that, because that's what the hackers would do. And then we're going to see who engages with that, who then goes to a Microsoft 365 page and inputs some credentials. Um, and we're obviously then they would be sharing 365 uh, email and password on the dark web. Now, the ideal is they don't engage, you know, they would be reporting that to IT or marking as phishing or whatever the, the best practices that you, you want an end user to do. But we're able to track. And then if somebody's been through that journey, we can then assign them an account takeover training course to say, look, this is what you've done. Um, unfortunately, you would have compromised your 365. Yes, there's things like MFA and all these other good practices in place, but but you will have revealed your username and password um, on, on the dark web. We, we have some schools actually that, will take the data from this and they will go and make the end user reset their password just kind of as a as good practice so um you can do what you want with the data i suppose is my message there's some great things you can do but but it's more around giving the visibility of who who would would really reveal that information online we've got kind of one drive account deletion as well there's loads of these different things google big library to choose from um or if you don't want to choose any there's a triage kind of process you go through so are you google are you microsoft how often do you want to run it um do you want to include personal life as well yes or no and then that will auto enroll your your environment on these on these phishing training programs okay so the next bit so we've talked about what the phishing looks like what the identification looks like i've shown an example of kind of microsoft 365 account takeover as well as some more personal life led ones now we're going to look at uh, the education side so i'm hoping uh that i can play a little sample here so um before i hit play and i'm hoping the audio is going to come through i'm just going to talk through the structure i'm not going to go into the portal itself and kind of demonstrate how a course is taken i'm just going to show a bit the a bit of the content but how a course is taken, so we would sit alongside Microsoft 365 or Google, so you can um, have your users in there, the single sign-on, so you don't have to generate passwords and things. And we would, dependent on the frequency, but let's say every other month, we would just distribute, a, what's this one, four minutes and 20 seconds long, uh, bite size snippet on, on cyber habits. Now, we generally don't overload the end user, so we're not going to look at necessarily multiple things in in a video so it's likely we would do the topic for this month would be phishing or would be ransomware or would be password management or social media so we like to focus on one kind of specific topic we have a couple of videos that will just surmise two or three good habits that are really good to start with but then we go deeper down um, but they are high level they're jargon free so i'm just going to play play this for kind of 30 seconds Cybersecurity is the protection of physical technologies and devices, as well as online data, networks, applications, and processes against criminal interference. Strong cybersecurity practices work to reduce the risk and impact of cyber attacks and to prevent any external or internal damage to businesses. The techniques used by cyber attackers are developing at an alarming rate, resulting in growing concern. In the past, the most dangerous cyber attacks involved physically hacking into networks, but now it's more lucrative and easy for criminals to take advantage of communication systems and cloud-hosted data. For a better understanding of the types of cyber attacks a business may encounter and the... I just pause that there. So kind of a quick snippet. I also noticed that I've put the business one in there, not the not the school one, so I do apologise for that. But, but the concept being that... Um, we're doing short animated videos. It will always talk about um, the attack type. So there's a structure that we follow in, in all of the training and it's um, what it is, how it can impact you, what you can do to avoid it. So taking phishing as an example, what is phishing? So let's you know demystify what phishing actually is, um, explain it in, in jargon free terms, um, how it can get you. So there's always somebody that's picked on, whether it's somebody in accounts or a teacher or a receptionist, we mix it up a little bit. Um, and then we talk around what that end user could have done to, to um, well, to have 
not engaged with it really so you know hovered over the links look for urgency reported it if in doubt so the good practices and we always follow that three structure that three-step structure um now the next bit i think is, cyber security is is key um is around the the student piece so um we've actually this is provided free charge to our customers as well so we we've had some um student videos created for uh staying well, we're going to build on it actually but it, but in, initially it's around cyber bullying really so what you can do to stay safe online as a it's targeted around 11, 16 year olds. So what support's available if you're getting a tough time? You know, the importance of helping uh, your friends uh, in these kind of needs. And I think where we've seen this really effectively deployed is um, we provide the assets, so posters and MP4 files, and in IT classes, maybe once a term or, or even once a year, it's just played on a big screen as part of um, part of the the class really so i'll play this for maybe 30 seconds a minute again um anyone that wanted to see you know the, the way a course actually runs with the multiple choice question all the quizzes sorry all the videos and courses have a quiz and an assessment at the end where we can gather the feedback but um if anyone wants to see how the reporting things work then we can actually do that as part of the follow-up session via net control but i'll play this one here just for so so, so this is a student one i'm going to play now in current times, there is no cyber security is the try again. In current times, there is no doubt that the internet and social media in particular are a major part of our daily lives. It was revealed in 2020 that over a third of British teenagers spend at least three hours a day scrolling through social media alone, and a fifth spending at least five hours online numbers that have likely increased since. Throughout lockdown, many students found themselves relying on online learning due to schools closing, meaning use of the internet and social platforms for daily learning and communication increased significantly. Although the internet does of course benefit our daily lives in many ways, it also comes with a number of risks, especially when it comes to our personal information. In this video, I will be talking through some of the risks that come with using the internet and social media, as well as some top tips to help you stay safe. One of the things that worries me when using social media is the personal information that I... So I'll just kick it on a little bit, um, where we show kind of some of the tips at the end. Reach out for help if you or your friends need it. Yeah, so at the end, there's some tips. It talks about kind of teachers being available, parents, friends. We list some charities that you can speak to around online bullying. But but the key is with all of this, it's around speaking out. That's what we're trying to encourage. So, you know, what why bullies bully online? But more importantly, you know, adults ha have a duty of care to make sure you're, you're being well looked after and the support is there. So if you're ever getting a tough time online, go and get help and that's the message of the video so it's bit we've had really good feedback on that and that that will be watched i wouldn't know exactly but but by hundreds of thousands of students this year um so a free resource so if anyone wants it just, just let that control know and we can provide it and there's some posters that go with it as well so coming kind of to the end now um there's some of the example posters that we that we can provide as part of the 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 promotion pack as well just so we're raising awareness via more than just the, the, the videos um all integrated with sso as as we've discussed um but the key is that we we um look at what we can do from a data perspective so um i mentioned around the the risk report so something that we've reduced recently is a league table um and what it will do particularly if you're a map but but this can be really useful in other areas is it can provide you a kind of a lead table of engagement on simulations by school so if you operate 10 schools you can see on a on a simple league table right which are my highest risk risk schools which are the highest risk departments within those and which are the highest risk individuals so that's all clickable via an, an embedded data driven dashboard you can export data either raw or via report so some really useful information to help to help um support the campaign and then one of the final things that we get uh, asked is what does it take so um if i wind back to the beginning uh, around where i mentioned that you know we, we intentionally are simple with our delivery method so 
it takes about half an hour of technical time to get the product up and running in your environment. And then it can be set and forget for 12 months. So it's very low admin, um, it's cost effective. Um, so typically it's, you know, this is a few pounds a year a user. It, it's kind of not, it, this isn't 50 quid a year a user type investment. You know, it, it's, it's certainly, uh, I say it's around a third of a cup of coffee per user per month. It's somewhere in that ballpark depending on, on license size, but it's not a big financial commitment. Um, and you will start seeing some value early on in the journey, particularly around giving you that visibility and turning the lights on, on for you. Um, we've had lots of schools uh, move move to this model um i think we're going to see continue to see more we are seeing insurance so this is a big takeaway from today actually so if you have business insurance and you're and you're confident that you're covered from a cyber perspective you should definitely check the terms or, or sometimes this sits with finance but that you don't have to do this um there's been a few examples that i know where um, they've been hit and they thought that they were covered, but because they couldn't evidence that they'd done regular training for the end users, then then it was quite a messy situation. So there are things that help um, promote the business case, something like this. And, and one of them very topical at the moment is around cyber insurance. So hopefully that's been a useful uh, session. We've kind of kept it to about, what have we been, about 40 minutes. Um, if there's any questions, uh, I'd be delighted to um, uh, set a further session up to kind of share the products and actually go through some of the quizzes in, in more detail or talk about how we can deliver this um, and lessons learned from, from, from rolling this out for many years. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Hope it was useful. Um, and Net Control and the team are here to support if you've got any questions further down the line. Thank you.